Hi, this is Joseph Komorowski. Welcome back. I'm your professor for this lecture. Um, we're still in Chapter 1, Basic Concepts uh, 1.4. So um, this section is on validity, truth, soundness, strength, and cogency. But what I do is I break it up into two assignments. So today we'll just be looking at validity, truth, and soundness. And what that relates to are deductive arguments. So in deductive arguments, um, we will... Look, so here we go. Point four. Um, <clears throat> yes. So let me remind you of a cheat sheet that you had uh, right here. So again, now we're um, 1.4. We're covering this today. Next time we'll cover inductive. But on deductive, um, bottom line here is if the premises are true and the argument is valid, the conclusion is sound. Um, so um, we talked last time if if you have a valid argument it has the right character form or structure and if you have the right character form or structure and your premises are true the conclusion is sound and what that means is the conclusion is forced upon you it's it's 100 percent true in fact it's impossible to be false if it has that right structure and the premises are true so it again provides um, necessary support for conclusion. If premises are true, conclusion cannot be false. Okay. Leave it like Thor's hammer coming down. If you've got the right structure and the premises are true, that hammer's coming at you. Okay, so let's go back. <clears throat> um, the figurative hammer, the mental hammer. All right. And what was the general guideline or the, the general application? Again, whether you're taking logical critical thinking. What role do arguments play in your life? Well, the conclusions, if true and the argument is sound, they, um, they're directed towards your rational attitudes. They affect the way you believe, right? So if you come across a good argument, you think, hey, I like that, sound. You take it on as a new belief, and it guides how you act in reality. That's the practical application. Now we go back to specific and to the, the deductive um, argument. So... Some of this will be reviewed because I've covered this last time, but um, thus a valid deductive argument go here, um, is an argument in which it's impossible for the conclusion to be false given that the premises are true. In these arguments, the conclusion falls with strict necessity from the premises. Um, conversely, an invalid deductive argument is an argument in which it is possible for the conclusion to be false given that the premises are all true. That just means the premises don't support the conclusion. Um, to test an argument for validity, we, get, we begin by assuming that all the premises are true. And for some of you, this is new, and I'll give you a few examples of this. I'll read it one more time. To test an argument for validity, we begin by assuming that the premises are true. And then we determine if it's possible in light of that assumption for the conclusion to be false. So right here, um, Hurley gives us an example. Um, on all television networks or media companies, in your mind, you think true or false. You think, yeah, NBC is a television network. Okay. And then therefore, NBC is a media company. Now, what you do is you ask yourself, if these premises are true, let's say you don't know that they are, but if they were, would this follow? And then you say, um, give me a second here. <clears throat> yeah, okay, sorry. Um, you say, if these, uh, if these two are true, would this follow? And, and they would, even if they were absurdly false. But it turns out they're true and this follows. Um, he gives you an example here. I'm going to give you a more, let me give you a better one, okay? And this is from my own, um, this is from a PowerPoint that I made. Imagine this argument. All men are mortal. Aristotle made this argument in regards to Socrates. And since Aristotle is the father of logic, let's all take a minute to pause here in a moment of silence. That is greatness. Ready? Go. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so all men are mortal. True or false? True. It just means, look, we all die. Men, uh, women, children, whatever. All persons, all men. Socrates is a man. Now, he was a man in the past, so that's true. Um, 
But again, when we're thinking about validity, we're not actually asking if those are true. We're saying, if they were true, would the conclusion follow? And you look at that and you say, yeah, they would follow. Soundness comes in behind validity and says, okay, uh, it has the right structure. And what that means is we've assumed that the premises are true and it seems like the conclusion follows. It means like there's a magnetic pull um, that those premises have towards that conclusion. It means it, it forces it on you. And at the same time, the premises are true. Therefore, the whole thing's sound. Um, so if we see, look at it like that, they're all true. Um, so down here at the bottom, it's sound because you have true premises and it's valid. So the bottom line with validity is that it's hypothetical. You have to hypothetically assume that premises are true. Ask yourself, would the conclusion follow? You want to see, you want to assume that the connection between the premises are indeed strong. And if you, if you say, yeah, I assume that these premises are true and the conclusion doesn't follow, you know it's invalid. There's no, there's no right structure to it. But let's move on to another example, okay? <clears throat> and this is going to pull out validity even more. All dragons can fly. Now, I love Game of Thrones, so I'm always thinking about dragons. All dragons can fly. True or false? Now, most of us will say true. My daughter debated me, though. She's an animal science major. She's at UC Davis. She said, oh, no, no, Dad, baby dragons can't fly yet. I'm like, oh, my God. So anyways, for purposes of argument, let's just say all dragons can fly eventually. Number two, this seems like a really problematic premise. Joseph is a dragon. Um, now, it looks like it's absurdly false, right? Because I'm Joseph. I'm not a dragon. Wish. Um, therefore, Joseph can fly. That aside. Look at it one more time and ask yourself, if premises one and two were true, would the conclusion follow? Yes. If that were true and if that were true, even though dragons don't exist and Joseph doesn't fly, that doesn't matter. If they were true, would this follow? Yes. That just means it's valid. These support this, certainly. So, um... It's valid, but the premises aren't true. One was debatable with me and my daughter, but we assumed, okay, it's true. Oh, up here, I put false. Um, but Joseph is a dragon. This is the one that's super obvious. Okay, it's obvious that no human being is a dragon. That's the one that should stand out. But again, validity, it isn't worried about the truthfulness of premises. It just says if they were true. Again, hypothetical, okay? Look at another example. Okay, how many of you like movies? I love movies. I'm a movie junkie. Last semester, I'd say 2019, um, they had a movie, To Kill a Mockingbird. How many of you have read that in high school? I have. Um, I, just in a brief um, thinking about it, I was like, oh, I think it was about racism, but I'm not quite sure. It's been a long time for me because I'm older, right? What if I told you logic is very powerful in one sense? Some of the greatest movies you've ever seen have a very strong argument running right through it what if i told you we could summarize to kill a mockingbird literally in one two two premise argument with the conclusion and again right now we're going to test validity with it so let's go deductive reasoning court case to kill a mockingbird uses deductive and inductive argumentation okay so major premise all black men are evil minor premise tom robinson is a black man conclusion therefore Tom Robinson is evil. Now, based upon that dragon um, example we had last time, I want you to ask yourself if this premise is true and if that premise is true. Remember, we're going to test for validity now, and validity is hypothetical. We always say if it's true and if that's true, would this follow? Take a second to think about it. If all black men are evil, and if Tom Robinson is a black man, would this follow? Yes, it would. That just means, hey, that's a valid argument, right? Because if they were true, that really would follow. The reasoning is forced on you. And now the, now the, um, the main question, is it sound? Meaning, are the premises true? No, it's absurdly false that premise one is true, right? It's absolutely false. And... You can take black man out. You could put white man, brown man, any color you want. It's absurdly false. 
that's basically as racist as it gets, right? It was basically condemning all race, like all black, all white, all brown, it doesn't matter, right? And you could insert any name you want. But again, this happens to be related to Kill a Mockingbird. So validity deals with structure. And you, you ask yourself, if premise or premises were true, would this fall? Yeah. So we say, that's a valid argument. And it turns out um, this premise is false and this one's true. All it takes is one false premise and boom, the entire argument collapses and it's unsound. So again, the bottom line of this book is Atticus uses these closing arguments to attack the major premise. He said, look, this is crazy false. Now it turns out in the movie, sad to say, Tom Robinson, um, he never committed the crime and I think he got killed. So the movie's about racism and the lawyer basically diffuses that. And, um, and then, and then on top of it, like I said, Atticus uses inductive reasoning. It shows that it was impossible for Tom to have committed the crime. So awesome movie in the sense that it promotes a bad idea in the sense that you can weave through the bad idea and get straight at the core of it. Say, look, racism sucks. And it's, and it breaks your heart to see stuff like this, right? But it also shows us what not to do, not to be racist, right? And again, to be fair, you can insert any color you want here. Move on to this next one. Um, there's no argument for this, but this is just, you know, just in case you want to see another really good movie, American History X. Um, it's about racism again, prejudice, really powerful movie. But I warn you, the first five minutes are, they're graphic. And you can't undo what you see. And you might not have ever seen something like that before. But these are good movies. Again, what's the argument? Racism. It's bad. But in To Kill a Mockingbird, it's much more structured. Okay. So um, I want to give you another example. This is very powerful. This is the greatest argument in the history of the United States. You ready to hear it? The greatest argument in the history of the United States. Yeah. All right. Major premise. How many of you knew that the Declaration was built upon a very simple two premise, one conclusion argument? Syllogism. Here we go. Tyrannical leaders deserve no loyalty. What's tyrannical mean? Anybody? Something bad, right? Something real bad. You, you, you simple fifth grade Trump language. That's bad. That's really bad. Well, that's what tyrannical is, right? Somebody who could care less about you, take advantage of you, would kill you, do anything. To, they just don't care about you, right? They're a tyrannical leader. Jefferson states that this is one of these truths that are self-evident, right? He says, you don't have to reflect on this too long. All you have to do is know the definition of tyrannical and you realize you don't want to serve under them. You shouldn't be loyal to them. Then he says, through the Declaration of Independence, you know, you can read this on your own time, but we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, they're all endowed with a creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, so he goes on and he says, look, this is just obvious. And he says, that's too. King George III is a tyrannical ruler. How many of you knew that the reason we have Independence Day was because we were fleeing King George III? Some of you might be like, yeah, I knew that. Because you, you, know, you recently had a history class. Some of us may have forgot, right? So he says, look, this guy's a tyrant. He's a tyrannical ruler. Because again, premise one, tyrannical leaders there's no, there's there no loyalty. Premise two, hey, this guy's a tyrannical ruler. The majority of the Declaration focuses on proving this. And Thomas Jefferson, he literally gives 18 reasons, at least 18 reasons for why that premise is true. So this is a deductive argument. We'll see later on, it's using inductive reasoning. He's gathering research. He's saying, look, I'm going to prove this premise to you. And he gives you examples. He has refused to assent to the laws, the most wholesome and necessary for public good, meaning he doesn't care about the, the people and their wholesome good. Um, he has forbidden his governance to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people. Again, these are just three reasons. There's like 15 more. You can read those, right? Whatever he's up to, he's gonna conclude, therefore King George deserves no loyalty. Now we can see the argument in full, okay? Just like the dragon argument, just like the kill a mockingbird argument, and just like the Aristotle argument, all men are uh, mortal, dealing with Socrates. Here we get another one. And I want you to ask yourself, if 
premise one was true, and if premise two was true, would premise three follow? Yes. And it just so happens that they are true. The premises are true. So in this one, you have a sound argument. What that means is, in order to have soundness, you must have validity and you must have true premises. So this is review for section 1.4, or at least that first part. Valid just means you grant that the premises are true, even if they're false. You just say, if they were true, would this follow? Yep. And are the premises true? Yep. Why is this argument awesome? Well, if you were an American citizen and you deny that argument, it's like self-refuting rationality. It's like, look, the reason you're free to use your rationality to deny that argument is because somebody made an argument on your behalf, Thomas Jefferson. I personally think that Thomas Jefferson was badass for doing this. I had no idea until a few years ago that this was a small argument that steered the ship of the Declaration of Independence and later on the Constitution of the United States because Thomas Jefferson and the people that signed the Declaration said, look, we want to be free from you, King George III. You're not really treating us good and we're, we're out of here. And how we can simplify that all in one argument is just, it's awesome. So that's clear cut. Um, reasoning using a deductive argument, and it's, like I said, the greatest in the United States. So how many of you are more proud now to be an American citizen? I know I am, and I'm thinking Thomas Jefferson for it. Okay, so those are some examples of how we test for validity and soundness. And you can look at some examples here where they go wrong, and some are right. Um, another quick note, I would say, I forget what page it is in your book, but I highlight this just so that you can look at it. And it talks about validity one more time. And by the way, when I make these videos, I already assume that you've done the reading. I only pull out things that I believe are important. And you can look at some of the rest on your own. But read this highlight. This explains validity again. And right here. So he goes into a chart, um, table 1.1, and he gives you valid arguments and then he gives you invalid arguments again invalid means that even if the premises were true the conclusion would not follow all of these right they're all invalid and they have different variations and it, it tells you over here in one you have true premises false conclusion another one false premises true conclusion what's really going on is he's trying to break down all possibilities of how you can have validity and invalidity with true or false premises okay so let's stick with a simple one True premises, true conclusion. All flowers are plants. All daisies are flowers. Therefore, all daisies are plants. If these were true, would this fall? Yes. But I want you to notice something deeper now. Remember, um, remember in this document right here, this um, differences between deductive and inductive reasoning. Scroll down with deductive. You can recognize a form. All, none, some. Remember those words? Categorical syllogism. Now go here and tell me, does it have the word all? R, it does. So these are in that form. And there, there's a pattern now. If you look at this one, this one, and this one, seems like they all the same form. And they can be broken down. So let me give you the simple, simple one. See how that says all flowers are plants? You could say all F are P. All Fs are Ps. All flowers are plants. All daisies are flowers. All Ds are Fs. Therefore, all daisies are plants. All Ds are Ps. What we're doing is, is we're abstracting now away from the language and we're giving a letter to represent this word, another letter to represent that. So notice we have two flowers, two Fs, a P and a D, a D and a P. See that pattern? Represent it like that. Could you do the same thing with any letters? Sure. You can say, you can use A, B, Cs, X, Y, Zs. We're just making it easy and using F, P's, D's because they are the first letter of the word, okay? So it turns out all of these have the same pattern. So whenever you come across an example in your homework on MindTap or in the book, and you come across the same pattern, all X's are Y's, all Z's are X's, therefore all Z's are Y's, you know it's valid all the time if it's in this form. Again, if you wanted to use different letters, so we could do, all X's are Y's, we'll just say all A's are B's. And then in the second line, we'd have to say all C's are 
A's, then the conclusion, all C's are B's. Okay, so I'm just giving you an example. Now, if you're listening to me and you're driving or whatever, you can go back home, you can look at that, and you can use different letters just to make they're consistent. Now, just make sure they're consistent. See how the X's line up? All X's are Y's, all Z's are X's. Just make sure you have two. So I, uh, I can't, I can't like um, show, I can't show you the um, the circle over that while I'm highlighting the uh, sticky note there. But again, just make sure uh, X, Y's, and Z's line up the same as your A, B's, and C's, and then you've got the same pattern. What am I trying to say is all of these are have the same form, even though they're talking about different things. This is talking about flowers, daisies, and plants. This is talking about dogs, tigers. All same form, they're all valid. And that just means if the conclusion or if the premises are true, the conclusion would follow. Okay. On the invalid side, you could diagram this out, the same thing that you did over here. You could represent these words with letters. And you're going to see that we're going to be doing this quite a lot in chapter six. This is kind of like your hint at starting to do it now. How would you represent all flowers or plants? All Fs or Ps. How would you represent all daisies or plants? All Ds or Ps. Pretty easy, right? Therefore, all Ds or sorry, all daisies are flowers, all Ds are peas. Real simple. You could make those X, Y, Zs, or ABCs if you want. Like I said, we happen to use Fs, Ps, and Ds because it's the same letter of the, uh, oh, it's the first letter of those words. Now, all of these have the same pattern on this side that could be represented like this. All, all X's are Y's, Z is a Y. Therefore, Z is an X. So whenever you're looking at a homework problem, no matter what words you're looking at, if you see this word all, right? No matter what words are in here, you could simply simplify those words into letters. So you can symbolize, excuse me. And if you symbolize to where you get that sort of structure, all X's are Y, Z is an Y, therefore Z is an X, you know it's invalid no matter what doesn't even matter what you're talking about, whether you're talking about roses, flowers, beers, tigers, doesn't even matter. It's the structure. And that just means even if these two premises are true, the conclusion would never be true. And it gives you an example all the way down. Okay. Um, yes. So that just really hashes out validity and invalidity. Um, what else? And just to conclude, as far as deductive, and next time we'll look at inductive, but just to conclude, we're looking at one thing. Is it a sound argument? So, you know, sometimes we say, is that a good argument? What we really mean is that sound. You know, from a logical perspective, these are the words you want to use. And you want to say, if it's sound, that means it has validity and it has true premises. What does validity mean? For review, it means if you grant a premise or premise is true, would the conclusion follow? And if it does, it'd be valid. If not, it's invalid. So notice this, to have a sound argument, you have to have two conditions. You have to have validity and you have to have true premises. If one of these is missing, it's unsound, okay? So to have soundness, you have to have two conditions, valid, validity, true premises. If one premise is false, the whole thing's unsound. If it's invalid, if, if, if you grant the premises true and the conclusion doesn't follow, it's unsound. Sometimes you'll have both of these to have a defect, sometimes just one, okay? Um, but now let's go down to a couple homework examples before I conclude. Yeah, and this is really good. And I'll say this, this summary at the end of this chapter is really awesome. I would read through this, but um, just as a review, so we start with statements. Statements are either true or false. It kind of gives you a taxonomy of what we're doing with these arguments. Then it says groups of statements, they're either arguments or non-arguments. We saw this already, you know, different types of non-arguments in 1.2. And then if you have arguments, you either have deductive or inductive, that's where we're at now. And if you have deductive, you have valid or invalid, and you have sound or unsound. Next time we'll see inductive that has this structure. 
So it's kind of like a break. It's a really cool breakdown on what's going on. Um, let's go down. Okay, so in these examples, determine whether each is valid or invalid, um, and then determine which ones sound or unsound. So let's just say, if you're following along with me, each one of these will have two answers. First, is it valid or invalid? And is it, or sorry, valid or invalid? And then is it sound or unsound in section one? See, next time we'll be doing this, section two is all inductive. Section one's all deductive. So we know these are all deductive examples, all right? Let's try this. Since Moby Dick was written by Shakespeare, and Moby Dick is a science fiction novel, it follows that Shakespeare wrote a science fiction novel. Okay, to evaluate this deductive argument, we have to have two things for it to be so. We have to have validity, and we have to have both premises being true. Now, it looks like there's two premises because we have the word and. We'll find out later that and, well, it looks like one premise, right? Sense is a premise indicated word. Um, and it looks like that's one premise. It could be, but since it's divided by a comma and the word and, this could be two premises, premise one, premise two. It follows that. We know that that's a conclusion indicating um, sequence there. So we know this is the conclusion. Now, one of two ways. We can ask whether the premises are true or not first, or we could ask if it's valid. Which one do you want to do first? All right. We'll test validity. If the premise was true, if it was the whole thing, would the conclusion follow? Moby Dick was written by Shakespeare, and Moby Dick is a science fiction novel. Shakespeare wrote a science fiction. Yes. If the premises were true, the conclusion literally would follow. When I say premise or premises, just realize it could be either one because it's got the word and. So officially, I'll just say premises. There's two. Number one, number two. If those two were true, would this follow? Yes. So we know it's valid. Now, is it sound? Are the premises true? No. Moby Dick was not written by Shakespeare. And Moby Dick is certainly not a science fiction novel. It's fiction, but it's not science fiction. You know what I'm saying? Um, so, answer, we know that it's valid. It has a right structure to it. If you grant the premises true, the conclusion would follow. But we know that it's unsound. Why? Because it has a false premise or premises. Both of them are false, okay? So now let's go to four. The longest river in the South America is the Amazon. The Amazon flows through Brazil. Therefore, the longest river in South America flows through Brazil. So let's say we have two premises separated by the word and. So premise one, premise two. We know this is the conclusion. Why? Because it says therefore. Okay. If these two premises were true, would the conclusion follow? I'll give you a second to think that through. If you don't know, you just have to look it up. Is the Amazon in South America? Some of you haven't been down there. You'll be like, oh crap, I don't know. I'll look it up. Does the Amazon actually flow through Brazil? Well, you don't need to know those two to find out if it's valid. What you do is you assume that they're true. If I assume that the longest river in South America is the Amazon and that the Amazon flows to Brazil, would this follow? Yes, we know it's valid. Okay. Now, is it true? And if some of you had to look it up, fine. It happens to be that they are true. Both are true. It turns out the longest river in South America is Amazon and Amazon flows through. So this bad boy is sound, and that means that it has two things that needs to happen. It's valid, and it has true premises. This one, number seven. I, I, I kind of like this one. So all leopards with lungs are carnivores. Therefore, all leopards are carnivores. We know this is the conclusion. Now, now I, want to, I want you to ask yourself, if this premise were true, would this follow? All leopards with lungs are carnivores, therefore all leopards are carnivores. No, it's invalid because, and this is, this is kind of funky, some of you have to look at this over and over. All leopards with lungs are carnivores, therefore all leopards are carnivores. No. Um, you have to conclude all leopards with lungs are carnivores. So there's something defective going on, and this word lungs shows up in the premise, but not the conclusion. So it seems kind of tricky. 
Maybe it's trivial, but it's invalid. It just means if you were to grant this true, the conclusion would not follow. But it turns out that the premise is true, and it turns out that the conclusion is true. But that doesn't mean that the, the connection between them is um, valid. It just means that even if this was true, that doesn't follow. So it turns out that it's invalid, unsound, even though you have a true premise and true conclusion. Let's do the last one, number 10. Every province in Canada has exactly one city as its capital. Therefore, since there are 30 provinces in Canada, there are 30 province uh, provincial capitals. We know, and this is kind of backwards, we know that therefore is the conclusion. But it says therefore since. Now, this is good, and I'm, I'm glad I'm bringing this problem out for your homework. Therefore triggers a conclusion, but what does since trigger? It triggers a premise. So we know everything after that sense is a premise, and then the conclusion follows. So whenever you get a therefore sense, or whenever you get a conclusion indicating word and then a premise indicating word, just realize whatever comes after the premise indicating word is the premise. Then after the comma, that's the conclusion. So now, let's say this, I'll highlight it, okay? Oops. Ah, anyways, so we say, if every providence in Canada has exactly one city as its capital, and there are 30 providences Canada, therefore, there are 30 provincial capitals. So if we test for validity, we'd say, yeah, that looks valid. If both premises are true, yeah, that looks like the conclusion would follow. Now, is it going to be a Canadian? You would know that there's not 30 um, Providences in Canada, uh, I think 16. Uh, don't don't quote me. I'm not Canadian. It's either 12 or 16. So we know that it's valid, but it's unsound. That just means it's valid because if the premises were true, the conclusion would follow. But one false premise. We know that there's not that many providences, so it's unsound. So, anyways, I hope that these four examples really tease out um, validity versus uh, the difference between the argument having the right structure, sorry, let me go up here, which is validity and true premises. So when you test for validity, you're not worried about if the premises are true. You're, you're, you're hypothetically saying if they were true, would the conclusion fall, okay? So for some of you, this is confusing because it's new language, right? You're talking about soundness, validity, premises, and all that. Listen to this video a few times or a couple times, how many ever it takes. Look at my examples. Look at my PowerPoint examples, and then you know you'll realize the difference between validity and soundness. In other words, in order to have soundness, you need validity and true premises, but you actually could have validity without having soundness. You can have a valid argument, but you can also have a premise that's faulty and then it's not sound. So you can have validity without soundness, but you cannot have soundness without validity. Listen to that a couple times. Um, why? Because in order to have soundness, you need validity, okay? So I know that was a lot, but um, I hope you have a more firm understanding of deductive arguments and what we're after when we evaluate them. And when we evaluate them, we're looking for, are they sound? And that means there's two parts, are they valid or and do they have true premises? Next time, we'll talk about inductive arguments. Um, but in any case, I really hope that helped you and thanks for listening.